Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Jan Kara from SUSE Labs. I'm working on performance team, and I'll be speaking about controlling I/O. So, uh, what's actually the motivation of uh, controlling I/O? So, like these days, the sharing of the machine by different entities and by different entities, I can mean different processes or like different containers these days or different virtual machines. So simply the machines become more and more shared by these different entities. And so these entities need to share resources such as CPU, memory, or IO bandwidth. And basically this talk will be mostly about sharing of the IO bandwidth. Uh, so Usually when you have these different entities, they are not necessarily cooperating with each other or generally they are unaware of each other. So it has to be somehow involuntary sharing of resources. So you have to enforce some kind of sharing. Uh, although we don't like expect usually like strictly malicious entities. Uh, like we usually want to guarantee some quality of service to a particular container, VM, process, or we simply want to limit usage of resources by a particular entity. Uh, and so IO control is about how to do this for basically IO bandwidth. So uh, the basic concept uh, when controlling IO is or property is whether this control is work conserving or not work, work conserving. What does it mean? Uh, well, if the controller tries to maintain the overall uh, system performance, so if say like there is 100 megabytes per second of disk throughput available, uh, then you know, work conserving control will split these, this bandwidth among the entities that simply want to do IO. While non work conserving controller would just say limit each entity to 10 megabytes per second. And if there is just one, one entity that wants to do IO, then it will like only 10 megabytes per second of the IO bandwidth will be used regardless that like the disk is mostly idle. Uh, so usually the controllers pick some trade-off between like the totally work conserving, you know, you don't want to waste a bit of your total performance. And on the other hand, like the non-work conserving where you strict to limit every entity, usually each controller picks some trade-off between this because usually the trade-off is between like quality of service guarantees you can provide and the total system performance you, you, you can achieve because you don't want to waste too much total system performance. On the other hand, you want to provide at least as good quality of service guarantees as it gets. Uh, there are several levels at which uh, you can decide to control the IO to like limit the amount of IO or whatever. Uh, you can do this on per process level. You can do it on per C group level or you can, for example, control it on per IO type level. So you can like uh, treat differently reads and writes, say. Uh, there are several different controllers uh, in the kernel. Basically that's because controlling IO is inherently hard. And there is so far, I would say we have not really found a satisfactory solution to this problem. So there are multiple controllers and each one has some different properties and you, know, you have to pick what suits you best. So uh, you can do the control IO control inside the IO scheduler. You, you have like throttling controller, which is BLK, BLK throttle. You have IO cost controller, you have IO latency controller, and you have also write back throttling mm -hmm. controller. Uh, it is possible to combine any of these controllers. Like in principle, you can enable them all and you know, configure them all, but the results are likely going to be, let's say, unsatisfactory. Usually each of these controllers has its internal model of like how the underlying storage stack behaves. So like if I do this operation, then you know the expected result of this is you know this move in the 
IO parameters I observe, let's say, or an IO completion time will move this way or stuff like that. And if you simply, you know, stack these controllers, then these assumptions are usually violated. So basically overall the system behavior and achieved performance is just too bad to be useful. So usually you have to pick just one controller and use it. It's not really uh, very useful to stack them. Uh, so the first controller that's available uh, in the Linux kernel is uh, IO, uh, the control that's happening inside the IO scheduling. Like there are several IO schedulers available in Linux. Uh, now I will speak about recent Linux kernels. So it means like this block multi queue layer. So there is BFQ IO scheduler, there is MQ deadline IO scheduler, and there is Kyber IO scheduler. And of course, you can also turn off IO scheduling using the no op IO schedule. Now, out of these schedulers, only BFQ currently provides, like, let's say, extended IO control guarantees. MQ deadline allows some differentiation between reads and writes, you know, scheduling them somewhat differently, but only BFQ allows you to like configure, like let's say different, how different C groups, so controlling IO for different tasks or different C groups, stuff like that. Uh, actually for MQ deadline, supporting like different scheduling decision for different C groups, like something like IO priority for C groups and stuff like that is work in progress. So it's probably going to happen soon, but so far it's not there yet. Uh, so how BFQ control works. So BFQ, does so-called proportional shared weight scheduling, <laughs> uh, which is based on C group weights. Now, what does it mean? So, uh, you know, basically you, for each C group, you can set a weight yeah? in the picture in the right. Uh, you can see an example of C group three, where you have your root C group, then you have like C group eight, uh, A, and you have configured weight 100 for it. You have C group B, which has weight 200. You have C group C with weight 100 and C group D with weight 300. And now you want the throughput to be split like proportional uh, throughput available to the disk. Uh, you want that to be split proportional to the weights uh, you have configured. So uh, this splitting actually works in a hierarchical way. So basically we go level by level and split the available throughput. So if I say, I, uh, I have some throughput available, then at the first level, basically one third of this throughput will go to C group A and two thirds of this throughput will go to C group B. And then uh, when uh, then this two thirds are further split inside C group B. So basically uh, one quarter of those two thirds will go to C group C. So that's in total one sixth of the total throughput. And to C group D will go three quarters of those two thirds. So overall, C group D will get one half of the total throughput. Uh, now, the proportional weight uh, scheduling is actually work conserving, or at least in the way the BFQ implements it, it's, it tries to be mostly work conserving. Uh, so basically only C groups that have currently some IO queued that would want to submit some IO to the disk uh, are considered uh, when splitting this bandwidth. So like uh, for the tree to look like this in the right, then all the C groups A, C and D would have to have some IO to submit. And when C group doesn't have any IO to submit, it's simply removed uh, from the tree. It's not, uh, so basically the throughput is then split differently. Uh, then within the C group, there are possibly multiple processes and uh, the available bandwidth to the C group is split among these processes based on IO priorities, which can be conf configured like for each task uh, using the IO nice command or set IO priorities call. Uh, for IO priorities, there are actually three different IO priority classes, so-called uh, real-time, best effort, and idle classes. The default class is the best effort. Uh, and uh, the scheduling for different IO priority classes, IO priority classes works in such a way that basically the 
processes from, from lower I.O. priority class are served only when there are no processes in the higher I.O. priority class with I.O. to submit. So basically, for example, processes in real time I.O. priority class can completely starve processes in the best effort I.O. priority class and similarly for both these classes towards the idle I.O. priority class. Then with, within, like among the processes that have the same I.O. priority class, basically you can configure the priority inside this priority class and basically the different priorities correspond to different weights inside this tree uh so basically then the throughput is split based on the weights you know that are computed from the uh io priorities and that's just linear scaling so simply you know higher priority means higher weight uh okay uh so that's uh, about the how it basically works uh and now you know, there are several kind of pitfalls with this or, you know, reasons why you observe different results than you could maybe naively expect when you configure weights for C groups, like I have described. Like I have described that the throughput, that the C groups would split uh, bandwidth in a particular fractions, but, you know, the devil is in the details because you will frequently find out that actually the observed throughput is rather far from the configured uh, fractions. Uh, and basically, the one of the big reasons why this happens is that uh, usually C group doesn't have uh, IO to submit all the time. So <laughs> when this happens, then like consider, for example, two C groups, one is like has higher weight, one has slower weight. Uh, and, you know, they both like, submit one meg one megabyte worth of io and then wait, wait for it to complete and then you know then let's say do a bit of computation and then again submit like say 10 milliseconds worth of computation and then they submit another one megabyte of io and they both like higher priority and lower priority c group do this now you know what happens so first both have io to submit so the higher higher weight c group gets more bandwidth so it's able to complete its one megabyte of io faster than the lower priority c group okay but then the higher priority c group goes to that 10 millisecond computation period so during that time actually there is only the lower priority c group that still has some io to submit and during those 10 milliseconds it's actually perfectly able to submit all the IO that's still left to submit for it. So then basically, you know, what you will observe is that both C groups actually have the same resulting throughput. Because basically, while the higher priority C group, you know, didn't have any IO to submit, the lower priority IO, the lower priority C group was able to cram all the outstanding IO to the disk. And then when higher priority C group has you know, more IO to submit, it will, you know, queue it, but it has to wait until the disk finishes some of the lower priority IOs because, uh, you know, it's not able to take that many requests in parallel, for example. So it has to wait for a bit of lower priority IO and before it can submit more of the higher priority IO. So that's one of the effects that often happens. And this is related to the, uh, to the second point I have here, and that's the fact that current contemporary disks actually usually process tens to hundreds of IO requests in parallel. Yeah. This is especially uh, visible with SSDs, but you know, even like traditional rotational disks uh, today are able to process 32, let's say, requests in parallel or stuff like that. And uh, usually, if you have, uh, if you can queue more requests to to the disk to the storage, then the throughput is better. So uh, if the application is such that you know it always has I/O to submit and it always submits you know lots of requests in parallel, then it will get very good throughput. While the application with just you know does submit one request, wait for it, submit one request, wait for it, then this will get 
like this will result in rather low throughput. It's by far not the maximal throughput that the disk can provide you. So uh, as a, and this of course like also influences the resulting throughput you will observe. And effects like these are usually much more visible than the effects of the CPU plates you configure. So basically application which you know has a lot of IO to submit and submits it heavily parallelly is usually able to get much higher bandwidth despite like low C group weight than the process who has high C group weight but submits only one request and then waits for it and another request and waits for it. So uh, that's another big reason why uh, like you the observed throughput can be very different from the C group weight you have configured. Uh, okay, uh, another controller, request throttling controller. Uh, that's very different controller from the one in BFQ. Uh, in its basic configuration, uh, you can basically configure amount of bytes per second or and requests per second for a C group. So basically, uh, and you can set this limit separately for reads and writes. So basically, there is some time window, and for this time window, the C, like, no, for simplicity, let's assume it's one second. And so for this time window, the C group will receive certain amount of budget, like in terms of number of requests and bytes. And basically during this time window, the C group is, uh, you know, the controller will let this C group to submit only as much as it has budget for. Uh, hierarchical control in this uh, IO controller is implemented by IO bubbling up the C group tree. So, uh, you know, if you have a C group which is IO, you know, it checks its budget. If it still has budget to do this IO in this time slice, it will submit it, which means that it will just push it up the C group tree to the parent. And in the parent, we again consult the budget. And if there is budget to dispatch from the C group, then we will again push it up in the C group tree until we, we reach the root C group. And, uh, you know, from the root C group, we submit the IO to the device. Uh, so this controller is useful for stuff uh, like, you know, limiting the C group to the bandwidth the customer has paid for. Yeah. So, you know, suppose you are hosting VMs, the customer has to pay, you know, for how much bandwidth he wants to get to the disk. And so, you know, we will constrain his C group uh, only to that bandwidth which he has paid for, and you don't want to give him more than he has paid for. Uh, now, but it is like in this basic setting, the controller is not very useful for situation where you want to like guarantee bandwidth to a particular C group, because basically then you would have to have to set the limits to uh, you know account with the worst case. Yeah? So if we have several C groups, say four C groups, and you want to guarantee bandwidth to one of the C groups, then you would have to limit all the other C groups to rather low bandwidth. Uh, by assuming that all the other C groups would be like IO hooks and would like to submit as much IO as possible so that you can still leave out some bandwidth for the C group you want to protect. And this basically way, wastes a lot of total system performance. So uh, that's why this controller also implements something which is called low limits. And the original limits I was speaking about are called max limits. And the controller uh, switches between two states. Uh, so, you know, by default, it enforces slow limits. So basically, you know, if you have limit configured for low limit configured for a C group, you know, this will be the limit which is going to be initially enforced. Now, once all the C groups that have low limit configured are running at their low limit, so basically all of them are throttled by the fact that they've reached, they've you know, used up all their budget for a time slice, uh, then you will switch to another state, which is here, and that's enforcing max limit, max limits. So uh, then basically the idea is that initially you, you know, limit all the C groups low, and then when they all like are 
bumping against this limit, you will release the limit and you know you will increase the limit to the max limit. And while all the C groups can submit at least the low limit amount of IO, you will keep enforcing just the uh, max limit. So like at this point, basically the low limit really becomes the amount which is guaranteed to a C group. And if the C group is not able to like submit the low limit of IO, then you know you will switch back to the initial state and all the C groups will be limited by the low limit. Uh, now, the problem with this uh, idea as it is implemented is with C groups that you know are not really IO hooks that simply occasionally submit a bit of IO because these usually do not reach even the low limits, but you don't want them, you know, you don't want to limit all the C groups to low limits just because there is some C group it doesn't want to do much IO and, uh, you know, so is not able to reach even low limit. So that's why actually there is another mechanism built into the controller and that's the latency control. So there is like, you can configure a latency target for a C group uh, and, uh, simply a C group that is not reaching low limit is, you know, causing the switch to the low limit enforcing only if it's IO completion latency exceeds the latency target that's configured. Okay, so that was about the throttling controller. And then we can move on. To the IO cost controller. So this controller is somewhat similar to the BFQ controller. Uh, it also implements like proportional weight based control. Uh, but you know, for BFQ, the cost of IO was simply the number of sectors that are there. So what's or for the basic number of bytes that are there in the IO request. Uh, the IO cost controller has a more complicated cost model, hence the name. Uh, so the, I, the cost of IO request is some constant A plus some factor B times the length of the IO. And these factors A and B are actually dependent on the type of the IO, where you know the type of the IO means whether it is read or write, and whether the IO is local or distant. So like there is some fixed constant, let's say, and we, uh, the controller considers how far the current request is from the previous request. And uh, you know, based on that, decides whether this, this request is local or distant. So you can configure these four, con uh, these four constants uh, or these two constants A B for these four various cases. So you can set these arbitrarily as you wish, based on the properties of your underlying storage. Uh, and then. Uh, the controller is also monitoring. So basically, the controller is now enforcing, uh, you know, uh, oh, again. So, so the controller has some budget it's able to give out for one time slice to all the C groups. And it splits the budget according to C group weight in the same way as BFQ splits the budget. Yeah, that's exactly this splitting of budget is exactly the same for BFQ and this IO cost controller. Uh, and uh, you know the budget uh, and the controller constantly monitors how the disk does under this load. So if we see that actually the disk is being congested, despite the fact that you know we limit each C group to its budget, we know that we are giving out too much budget for one time slice. So we will reduce. So the controller will scale down the amount of budget. Uh, it is giving out in each time slice. And similarly, when we observe that the disk is underutilized, uh, we will scale up the amount of budget we split among C groups in each time slice. Now, how do we decide whether the disk is underutilized or, or overutilized? That's a bit problematic, but uh, what the controller does is that it observes whether the disk queue is getting full, so basically whether we are running out of uh, like request tags. So if we run out of request tags, we you know, consider this, the disk uh, congested. Uh, but this is very conservative signal. And actually, we are running out of uh, request tags usually much later than 
you know, when the disk is uh, really congested. So there is second uh, signal and that's uh, which you can configure. And that is uh, like you can configure and nth percentile latency. So basically if the IO completion latency, if the nth percentile of the IO completion latency exceeds the configured target, then uh, you know we will consider the disk congested and we will be scaling down the budget. And once the IO nth percentile of the IO completion latency uh, you know goes below the latency target, we will again scale up the number of uh, the amount of budget we give out in one time slice. Now uh, there is like there is still problem with this. Uh, like which can cost a lot of total system performance. And that is that when a C group simply has some IO to submit, but not enough to really use up its budget in the time slides, basically this amount of disk work or disk throughput uh, remains unused. Yeah? And so the disk can actually be idle during part of the time slice because simply it, uh, we didn't allow the C group, other C groups to submit more work to it. So usually people don't want this or they don't want their hardware sitting idly when there is more work to do. So the controller implements budget lending. So when it like observes that there is C group which like consistently doesn't use up its budget, then uh, the C group will borrow this budget or lend this budget to other C groups that have more work to do. Uh, now, of course, you have to trim down this lending when the C group suddenly, you know, has more I/O to do. So there are like lots of heuristics there, and the algorithm is relatively complex of how to split, how to split the budget. You know, you think you have available among other C groups that would like to have it. Uh, you now there are like three papers written on this, and uh, I don't even understand the details of this algorithm. So if you are interested. Uh, in the paper in the proceedings, there are links to the original paper explaining how the budgets are exactly split. Also, the controller uh, has a special handling of uh, metadata and swap requests. Uh, so, because, like, the, I'll speak why this is like later, but uh, when the request is uh, flagged as metadata or swap, then the controller will submit it regardless of the C group budget. Uh, and it will just, you know, so even if the C group is out of budget, request metadata and swap requests will be submitted. But uh, still the cost of the request is decremented from the budget. So like we allow to go the C group into the depth, let's say. So eventually the C group has to like pay off this debt but uh, like we don't throttle metadata or swap requests. Okay, another controller uh, Linux kernel offers is the IO latency controller. Uh, and uh, in this controller, basically, as you know, the name suggests, you can configure latency for each C group or latency target. Again, this target basically mean, uh, speaks about the IO completion latency. Uh, and also each C group maintains like limit on the number of requests it is allowed to submit in parallel. You know, we call this parameter QDEP. So uh, when the latency target is missed for a particular C group, so basically the IO completion latency for this C group exceeded the configured target, and we actually use different parameters uh, for measuring the IO latency for different types of storage. So for SSDs, we use the 90th percentile latency. So basically, uh, so 90%, this means that 90% of IO has to complete within the configured latency target. Uh, for uh, like rotating disks, we instead use like floating average of uh, latent IO completion latency of the requests. Uh, anyway, if this parameter simply exceeds the target, uh, we decide that we need to trim the Q depth of all the sibling C groups. So we go and reduce the Q depth uh, of all the sibling C groups so they are not able to submit uh, that much IO anymore. And once our C group is within the latency target, we will increase the Q depth of the sibling C groups again. 
there is also special handling of metadata and IO requests. Uh, so similar as for IO cost controller, basically uh, we submit these uh, requests regardless of the configured QDAP. So even if like we have already many outstanding requests or as many outstanding requests as our Q depth is, we will still submit swap and metadata IO, but uh, we will compute like delay, artificial delay, which will be inserted when this process is returning to user space. So, and this the length of this delay is such that basically we measure how long uh, the swap I/O would ta uh, takes. We add and you know we subtract this from the configured latency target, and then this is the delay we will insert. So basically, we insert as much delay to this insert so much delay to simulate that the I/O took. Uh, as long as the configured latency target. If we are submitting the IO when the queue is actually, or when we are already like out of our queue depth. So this is to, uh, to throw, uh, so this is so that like even process is doing like heavy metadata IO. So basically submitting only metadata requests get even truly throttled because basically we will delay them when returning to user space after submitting the IO so you know they are not able to submit as much of the IO eventually. Last controller is a uh, so-called write-back throttling controller. Uh, so uh, this is this controller doesn't allow throttling based on C groups, only uh, based on IO type. And it's a controller that's aimed strict, uh, mostly at uh, throttling write back of dirty data from the page cache because this tends to cause rather big uh, like spikes of IO and this uh, tends to increase the latency of reads that are happening or ten, uh, of generally this tends to increase the latency of other IO that's happening because there is large burst of these writes uh, and uh, so this controller you know, is aimed to limiting such burst of write back IO. It's inspired by the CODEL packet scheduling algorithm. So it actually tracks uh, minimum latency. Uh, in this case, it really tracks minimum IO completion latency for read. Uh, and when the minimum IO latency uh, is of over given time window uh, exceeds configured threshold, we will uh, limit the amount of writes that are that you know any process can submit uh, to the disk. So, like similar as in IO latency controller, basically uh, we limit the queue depth, uh, and there there are actually different limits for asynchronous, like background writes, and different limits for synchronous writes. Synchronous writes, you know, get somewhat looser limit. Uh, asynchronous write get tighter limit. Uh, when the minimum latency and then you know again goes under the configured latency target we will increase the queue depth that's available to the writes again uh, okay so i guess we are done with the write back control that's a simple one and now uh, let me speak briefly about problems that we often encounter when we are trying to control the IO. So <clears throat> first problem is with buffered IO basically. Uh, what does it mean? So probably you know, but by default, you know, the IO happens uh, to the page cache. So if you call read or write system call, then the IO doesn't go directly to the disk, uh, but it goes only to or from the page cache. So it is uh, seen by the IO stack and IO controllers only if the data actually is not in the page cache. Uh, you know, for reads, usually this is not a big problem. If it is simply the data is already in the page cache, you just set up the application from the page cache and we are happy that we don't have to use the IO bandwidth, so that's fine. But for writes, this tends to cause problems because writes happen also only to the page cache. So actually we will stack up, 
or uh, stack up writes in, inside the page cache and only when there is some amount of uh, pages accumulated, we will start to write them out or when some timeout passes. So, so the IO bottleneck actually tends to be visible only with uh, a rather big delay or it's not directly visible because, you know, so the application first dirty some amount of data in the page cache, then write back start. So it cleans some amount of pages. The application in the meantime generates more and more data in the page cache. Uh, and if the write back actually isn't as fast as the application generating the data, the dirty data, the dirty data accumulates in the page cache. At some point, it reaches a limit, you know, which is configured for the page cache, where the page cache says, okay, I don't want more dirty data. So only at that point, it actually starts to throttle the application that's generating the dirty data. So at that, at that point, uh, only we see that the uh, application is being throttled. Uh, so it's kind of harder to debug actually what's going on and you have to know all these details to be able to understand what's happening inside the storage stack. The other stuff, uh, the other part is that actually IO submission context for these buffered writes is not the context of the application that's actually doing the write, or not always, you know. Sometimes it's the context uh, uh, of the kernel process that's, you know, doing just the cleaning of the page cache. So for uh, this IO to be properly accounted to the C group that really generated the dirty data, uh, you need to track actually who has dirty these pages. You have to propagate this into the IO stack and there the cost of the IO can be properly accounted to a particular C group. So this requires support in the page cache uh, and C groups. And as a side effect, uh, this is why only unified C group hierarchy supports uh, proper tracking of buffered IO. And also it requires support inside the file system to uh, you know, properly do this tracking and setup of the BIOS when it is attaching, when it is submitting the IO from the page cache and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, currently, at least X, EXT4, XFS, and BTRFS do have the support uh, for this. Uh, so, like all the major file systems currently support this. You now, the other problem uh, that we often observe is the essentially a case of priority inversion. So, you know, as you know, the IO happens through the file system and file systems are rather complex beasts. So they have all sorts of internal locking and uh, also ordering dependencies. You know, there are shared file system by wide data structures or there is, you know, like the service called journal, which also tends to serialize, serialize things. Uh, so what, often happens is that if you throttle one process, you know, when doing IO, this uh, can result in other processes blocking behind this process because this one throttle process actually holds some shared resources. You know, think of a process that, you know, that tries to lo load the block allocation bitmap into memory, it gets throttled when loading this block allocation bitmap. Uh, and all the other processes that want to do block allocation have to wait for this process to unthrottle, finish loading of the allocation bitmap, and then they can start, then all the other processes can start allocating blocks. That's the reason why actually some of the controllers treat metadata IO especially, because in this case, the load of the bitmap wouldn't be throttled, it would only account it to the process that submitted the IO. And for similar reason, actually, swap IO is not throttled because again, it tends to then cause all sorts of uh, IO priority inversions. Uh, there are other cases uh, which are not catched by, uh, like which are from the similar, let's say, from similar bucket, but which are not catched by simply not throttling metadata and swap IO. And that's, for example, when a process gets throttled when it has like transaction open, then basically this blocks this transaction from committing and thus from us cleaning the transaction from the journal. So, you know, if there are other processes that need more space in the journal, they have to block waiting for this process to actually finish, finish its transaction because before they can start their own transaction and they can start modifying the file system uh, 
so again, you know, basically everyone gets stacked up behind the low priority process that gets throttled. Uh, and uh, this used to be especially painful for ext4 in data ordered mode because what happened there was that the journaling process doing transaction commit had to also write out the data from the page cache to uh, which was written to newly allocated blocks basically to achieve uh, like uh, to avoid stale data exposure uh, and so the journaling process committing transaction was doing a lot of IO from the page cache. And so if this dirty data was actually com uh, written by some low priority application or low priority C group, then the journaling set was often getting throttled. And this basically stalled all the journaling uh, progress on the file system and basically stalled everybody else. Now, these days, actually, ext4 implemented the allocation of new blocks differently, you know, it allocates blocks in so-called unwritten state. And so as a result, the journaling process, the journaling thread doesn't have to do as much page cache write out. Uh, okay, and that's about it. So uh, let me go to the conclusion. So like we have seen, uh, so control of the IO is rather difficult problem, mostly due to the deep and complex IO stack. You know, the behavior of the storage is non-trivial. It de depends heavily on the uh, type of IO workload and stuff like that. And as well, the behavior of the file system and stuff like that is rather complex. Uh, and there, so there is lots of different approaches to IO control. Each has its own like peculiarities, but you know, you have to pick the one which suits your need the best. Usually you have to make some trade-offs between the service guarantees you are able to provide to different entities and the overall system performance you are going to get. So uh, usually to get the satisfactory results on your setup, <laughs> uh, you, it requires quite a bit of manual tuning for a particular hardware and workload. Yeah? So you, you have to you know, observe your workload, how it behaves on your hardware, tune the parameters of the, uh, you know, pick the controller, tune its parameters, and then you can, these days you can usually achieve them satisfactory results, but it really requires quite a bit of manual work to configure this. So, so far I wouldn't say that the IO control problem is really solved. I believe we need to eventually come up with something better, but so far <laughs> we haven't found it out yet. So yeah, that's about it all from me. So if there are still some questions and we have like for time for a quick question. You are muted, Dario. I'm not, but the mic was <laughs> up <laughs> above my head, sorry. No, I was just saying that, uh, yes, there is some time for questions, uh, if anyone has any, and uh, I was thanking you for your presentation. If no one has questions, uh, or while we wait, uh, I, I am curious about something actually, although you probably answered already in the very last sentences uh, of the talk, uh, I was curious whether we do something, um, uh by default uh some 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 settings of this by default which are not the kernel default one i mean if we change the default uh, somehow in our distributions other SUSE or open SUSE. so uh, by default uh, we do not change anything uh so you know by default actually all the controls are turned off yeah so you have to like consciously con uh, configure Usually, so it will be, uh, Michal will be speaking more about it in his next talk, like how to do this actually from user space, you know, how you can configure this. So you have, usually you have to configure system D uh, to somehow enable the controllers for you and set the appropriate parameters. So, you know, we don't provide any like out of the box configurations for IO control, I would say. Partly, I would say, because it is hard, but be, uh, yeah, surely, like, wrapping it in some nice UI would be probably good. But as I said, at least currently, it requires quite a bit of uh, 
like experimentation to get the parameters right. Is yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it makes sense that the controller are um, not enabled by default. Oh, there is a question. There is an impact in modern laptop uh, slash mobile power saving methods, methods and IO. There any impact? Oh, uh, OK. So actually, uh, this grouping of IO that's so so like the controls are not really aimed at you know saving power and i'm not sure if you would be able to utilize them like that because the delays they you know insert are usually you know in terms of milliseconds at most uh which is probably not that interesting for saving power uh and also they like when the disk is idle they usually tend to submit the io to get the good throughput yeah but the system as such for example the write back system and stuff like that tries to delay the io and group it together exactly so that the disk is for example allowed to spin down and stuff like that so yes but for example for reads you probably don't want them to delay because if someone does read then basically it's there is expectation that you know the data is going to be needed and there is application that needs this data so if you are delaying this IO, you are delaying the user, and the user usually doesn't want to wait for the disk to come up, you know, so that it can save power. I usually, the user just wants the work to get done. So, for for the read IO, you probably don't want to delay it. For writes, we already do, do delay it to kind of we allow the disk to spin down. So there is configuration called laptop mode actually, which you can enable, which like even more tends to group and delay the write back of the IO from the page cache. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, not really, again, about default, but uh, what would be uh, interesting, probably I'm talking about uh, my main use case is virtualization. That would be, if not default, which is not possible, not only very hard, but probably not possible, it would be good to have uh, some uh, even generic advices that we could uh, give uh, out and yes. some documentations about uh, if you want to achieve, uh, I don't know, this level of fairness or if you want to prioritize uh, this or that other workload, uh, do something like that. But this is also quite hard, I guess. Well, uh, that's actually partially what we try to achieve. So Michal, you know, Michal's talk, okay. part of the motivation of it is actually exactly to gather then the results uh, in some kind of PID, a technical document that explains to the customers actually, you know, what they can configure, what are the likely results and what they have to watch for. And so at least we have this documented and then interested customers can like read it so that they don't have to find out everything on their own or actually through Bugzilla asking us why does this doesn't work yeah, because that's what happening now that usually customer tries to configure this then find some strange results and then opens the back and you have to explain to them that actually what they observe is kind of expected. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you again, then. Uh, we are at the end of the talk.